It's a blessing to be with you again to share God's word this morning. I'd like to invite your attention to Psalm 2, a sermon that I've entitled The Kiss of Life, Psalm 2. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves And the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet have I set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Verse 12, kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. Blessed are those who put their trust in in him, the kiss of life. First time I heard that expression was a story my mother told me quite often as I was growing up. Apparently, when I was born, I wasn't real excited about coming into this new world, she tells me. Mom had a, uh, a female obstetrician, which was fairly unusual to have a doctor who was female back in 1951, the day I was born, November 19th. <clears throat> but um, despite, you know, hanging me upside down by my heels and all the pats on the back side, she couldn't get any response from me. So the doctor laid me on a table, wiped off my face, and put her mouth around my face and breathed breath into me and finally I began to cry which was for some reason what they want to hear when we come into this world. Mom said she remembers when I was handed to mom a big ring of red lipstick all the way (laughs) from above my nose and around my chin. She said you got your first kiss the day you were born, the kiss of life. And she liked to tell me that story, and of course it made me feel like God had a purpose for me being here because uh, that day was successful. This verse speaks, I believe, of a kiss of life. And I think this is an important uh, scripture for us all this morning as we look into the Word of God. This is a very important psalm. It speaks, of course, of, of Jesus. Jesus, who has been vested with God-given authority and ultimate victory over all created things. This is a messianic psalm, certainly speaking of of the kings of Israel as they are invested with the anointed office of the theocracy, standing in the place of God and serving uh, for God over the people of Israel. But ultimately, the final king, the ultimate Davidic king, Uh, the the ultimate Davidic ruler, uh, the Son of God in a very real sense will be enthroned. Verse 7, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son today. 
I have begotten you, ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. There is coming a day when Jesus Christ will sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem and rule this world with a rod of iron and all of the, uh, the insolence of the kings of this earth and all of their, their, uh, their speech and hatred directed against God and his anointed will be rectified by the rule of Jesus Christ. Jesus vested with God-given authority and ultimate victory over all created things. The psalmist enjoins us at the end of this important messianic son, uh, psalm, verse 12, he enjoins us to kiss the son. Kiss the son. What does it mean to kiss the son? Well, we think of kiss, a kiss in our culture, and kiss, of course, has symbolism. In our culture, kissing is connected with romance. We see it on the silver screen. We, we uh, think of it in terms of, of lovers, of husbands and wives. And our culture has kind of framed the kiss in a particular way. But we're not so interested in our culture. We need to read the scriptures in light of the culture in which it was written. And we have to understand that other cultures think about symbols in different ways, particularly the symbol of the kiss. I think of ancient Near Eastern culture. I, I know we have seen on news accounts of, for example, Arab oil ministers getting together for a meeting of OPEC. And here are these you know, men in, in their robes and their turbans, and they're greeting each other with a kiss. It's a different thing in their culture. I'm really hoping that that doesn't catch on in our faculty meetings. I'm not really looking forward to that kind of thing. But in their culture, it's very much a part of, of the way that they think and the way that they behave. We know in Romans chapter 16, verse 16, Paul enjoins the members of the church to greet one another with a holy kiss. It's not the kind of thing we do in Minnesota. Uh, it's not the kind of thing we do in the United States. But the point is that, there's, that there is a culture of the kiss. There's symbolism in the kiss in the ancient Near East that is going to help us understand what the psalmist is enjoining us to do when he says in verse 12, kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his, his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. I think we need to understand Psalm 2, verse 12, then, in terms of ancient Near Eastern and biblical culture. And I think the lesson of this psalm for us this morning is that you will not experience, I will not experience fullness of life unless we have kissed the Son, the kiss of life, fullness of life. If you and I this morning want to live in fullness of life as God expects life to be for us, we need to kiss the Son. So what does it mean to kiss the Son? What are the connotations of a kiss in the ancient Near East and in Scripture? I think the kiss is symbolic of at least four things that we're going to look at this morning. That are going, these will help us understand what the psalmist is asking us to do. First of all, a kiss in the ancient Near East in Scripture was an act of worship. It was an act of worship. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18. This verse is set in the context of Elijah. Elijah, who was ministering to the northern tribes of Israel, he had uh, served God in this land that was moving away from the worship of the one and only true God. They were embracing the worship of Baal. Their king had married a Phoenician uh, princess, and Baalism had, had, had swept into the northern tribes and virtually eliminated the worship of Jehovah God. Elijah was led to Mount Carmel, and he fought the prophets of Baal in a battle of, of the supernatural. Who is the true God? And God had proved himself 
through the sending of the fire that consumed the meat and the altar and the water. You remember the story, the victory of Elijah on Mount Carmel, but, but Jezebel, the queen, was, was angered by this contest, and she threatened the life of Elijah, and he fled. He fled to the wilderness and eventually to Horeb where God met with him. And Elijah said, God, I'm the only one left. No one believes in you anymore. And here's what the Lord said to Elijah in 1 Kings 19, verse 18. I have yet 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. A kiss was an act of worship. An act of worship. That's why the New American Standard Bible translates verse 12 of Psalm, Psalm 2. Instead of kiss the sun, they say do homage to the sun. It's an act of worship. It speaks of devotion to deity. It's a symbol of devotion to a God. I have 7,000 who have not kissed Baal. They have not devoted themselves to Baal. It's an act of devotion to deity. It's paralleled in verse, um, in, uh, verse 12 here with the bowing of the knee. Um, it says, actually, I'm sorry, in 1 Kings 19, 18, it's paralleled with the bowing of the knee. I have yet 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. Bowing to a God uh, showed your obeisance to him. It showed your devotion to him. And these, these, um, these attitudes symbolized by the kiss are objectified by actions. Devotion to deity was evidenced in subjugation. Devotion to deity, symbolized by the kiss, is evidenced in subjugation. And subjugation to deity is evidenced in trust. So the evidence of this devotion is subjugation, and the outworking of the subjugation is trust. That is, to kiss a deity is to recognize his value, his claim to godhood, and is to then subjugate yourself to dependence on him. Israel had come to depend upon Baal. Baal was the God they cried out to in their fears. Baal was the God they cried out to when they needed rain. Baal was the God they called out to when they needed food. To kiss a deity was to recognize his worth and to subject yourself to him. That, in fact, is the direct teaching of Psalm 2. Look at verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord. Capital L, capital O, capital R. Capital D, against Yahweh, against Jehovah. They've set themselves against Jehovah and against his anointed. The issue in Psalm 2 is those who oppose the one and only true God, Jehovah God. And the psalmist is calling them back to belief, back to faith. And the nations who don't believe in him, calling the nations to faith in Jehovah. Verse 10, now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve Yahweh. Kiss the sun. A kiss is an act of worship. It speaks of devotion to deity and it's evidenced in subjugation. That subjugation is evidenced in trust. Notice the end of this verse again. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. And here's the question this morning. Have you put your trust in the son? Have you kissed the son? This is an act of worship. It's recognition of his deity. 
There is one and only true, there is one only, uh, there is only one true God. He has sent his son, Jesus Christ. And the question is, have you recognized the worth of Christ? The worth of Jehovah God. Have you recognized the deity of God and his son and believed and trusted in Jesus Christ alone? God has sent his son to be not only the king who will rule all things at the end, but to be the savior who makes possible those of us who are willing to trust in him, to believe in who he is and place our faith in him, to subjugate ourselves to the son, to make it possible for us to be a part of his rule and his kingdom. A kiss is an act of worship. And I would ask you this morning, have you kissed the son? Have you believed in Jesus, the Messiah? Have you trusted in his person and his work as your savior? So a kiss, first of all, is an act of worship. But a kiss also in the ancient Near East and in scripture is an act of loyalty. It's an act of loyalty. We see that in 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 1. 1 Samuel 10, 1, then Samuel took the flask of oil, poured it on Saul's head, kissed him and said, has not the Lord anointed you a ruler over his inheritance? You know the story. Israel was looking for a king. They were seeking someone to be a ruler after the elders, after the judges, after the death of Moses and Joshua. They wanted a king. They wanted a king like all the nations. And God, of course, was not pleased with that request uh, completely, but God determined to give Israel kings, and the first king he gave them was Saul. Samuel, the prophet, was uh, called to gather together uh, the potential candidates, and eventually Saul, the most humble of the sons, uh, was found, and uh, he was anointed the king. And Samuel, an anointing king Saul, took the flask of oil, poured it on Saul's head, and kissed him. This was an act of loyalty. Saul, the prophet of God, was swearing his allegiance to the king of Israel. It's an act of loyalty. It speaks and symbolizes uh, of dedication to leadership. This is the man who's going to stand in the place of God and lead the nation of Israel. David, of course... Uh, as a young man, was devoted to Saul. He served in the palace of Saul. He saw Saul as God's anointed. And remember, remember as Saul began to turn away from God and his kingship began to decline, he was at enmity with David. He sought David to kill him because he knew God was raising David up to take his place. And on more than one occasion, David had the opportunity to kill Saul. But David said, I will not lay my hand on God's anointed. Even the man who, in the final battle of Saul and Jonathan, came across Saul who had been wounded. Saul was dying, and this man uh, decided to kill Saul. And he went to David, thinking David would be elated that his antagonist, Saul, was dead. He went to David and said, I saw Saul wounded in the battle, and so I took his sword and I killed him. But David was not delighted with that news. In fact, David had that man executed because he took the life of God's anointed. David was loyal to Saul. Samuel kissed Saul. This uh, dedication to leadership was evidenced in submission, an undying loyalty and an unfeigned service to a sovereign. And Samuel himself, who had kissed Saul as his king, was so loath to turn away from his loyalty to Saul that even when God told Samuel, I'm going to remove Saul from the kingship because of his disobedience to me, Samuel had to be rebuked for his continued loyalty in 1 Samuel chapter um, in 1 Samuel chapter 15 and chapter 16. Saul grieved 
Uh, Samuel grieved to the point of rebuke, having to give up his loyalty to Saul. He had kissed Saul. He had sworn his loyalty to him. A kiss in the ancient Near East was an, was an act of loyalty, evidenced in submission. Can you think of, of, of another kiss that, um, that this truth in the Old Testament turns into a more heinous act in your mind? The kiss of Judas. Judas betrayed the Lord with a kiss. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Because a kiss is an act of, of, of dedication and, and submission to leadership. But deceitful kisses are an act of infamy. I wonder if you have subjugated yourself to Jehovah God, you believed in his son, but you have failed in your submission to him as leader. You have feigned loyalty, you have, but, but you have practiced duplicity. Perhaps like Judas, you have kissed the Lord with your lips, but you've betrayed him with your life. The question I think the psalmist would ask us this morning is this. Have you surrendered to Christ's leadership? Is he the Lord of your life? Are you living in total submission to his will? A kiss is an act of loyalty. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way. A kiss is not only an act of worship, evidenced in submission. It's an act of loyalty, evidenced in submission, but a kiss is also an act of affection. It's an act of affection. This is how we think of a kiss. Uh, Ruth chapter 1 and verse 9. Ruth chapter 1 and verse 9. Then Naomi kissed Orpah and Ruth, and they lifted up their voices and wept. You remember the story. Naomi had moved with her husband to Moab because of the famine in Bethlehem. Her sons had grown up and taken wives from the Moabitess women. Her, her husband died. Her sons had died. Naomi heard that the famine was over in Bethlehem. She was going home. And here are her Moabite daughter-in-laws. She encourages them to stay with their family because her sons are dead. And she's departing to go back to her homeland and these women meet, as it were, for the last time, and Naomi, Orpah, and Ruth weep. She kisses her daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, and they lift up their voices and wept. A kiss is an act of affection. It speaks of a determination to love. Again, this is how we most commonly think of a kiss. In our marriage ceremonies, we hear these words. Forsaking all others, keep ye only unto her so long as you both shall live. You may kiss the bride. You have sworn your love to your spouse and to your spouse alone, and you kiss your bride. This is a determination to love. It's evidenced in selflessness. It's abandoning personal desires to give yourself to another. Love, we know, in, in the Bible, is not, uh, it's not a feeling. It's not just an emotion. Love is an act. It's an act of surrender. Surrendering, your, surrendering yourself, giving of yourself to another. Out of devotion, out of love. I remember when our junior high youth sponsors in my little home church in Kansas told us that they had never kissed until their wedding day. And of course, as junior high kids, we thought, you know, that was as old-fashioned as Model T's and Victrola's, although some of you in this room have no idea what those are. Um, I mean, we just thought that was, that was crazy. Of course, the older I got, the more I had respect for, for that truth and for that symbol in their lives. A kiss is an act 
of love and selflessness. That which is freely given is of little value. We know that when free things are given to us. That which is freely given is of little value. In Ruth chapter 4 and verse 16, Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, Naomi. But Ruth, it says, clave to her, King James Version, clung to her. Ruth stuck with her and went with her, though Naomi turned back. That's an act of selflessness. A kiss of affection does not mean much to a woman when she knows those affections are not hers alone. And so it is with Christ. It's easy to replace him with other loves, love of the world, embracing its philosophies, reveling in its pleasures, courting its accolades of prestige and power, infatuation with its things, with its substance, all the, while, all the while Christ is the only pure and worthy object of our love and affection. And he weeps over our infidelity. Here's the question this morning. Have you pledged your undivided love to Jesus? And do you live for him solely and selflessly? A kiss is an act of of affection, determination to love, evidenced in selflessness. Have you kissed him and him alone? Or do you have other loves this morning? The psalmist says, kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. So we've seen from ancient Near Eastern culture and scripture that, the, that a kiss is an act of worship. It's an act of loyalty. It's an act of love. Finally, a kiss in the scripture is also an act of reconciliation. It's an act of reconciliation. In Genesis chapter 33 and verse 4, we read about the reunion of Jacob and Esau. If there were ever two brothers who had issues between them, it was these two. Fighting, duplicity, um, stealing of birthrights and, and all kinds of things that would cause all kinds of tensions in their family. Finally, uh, Jacob had to flee his home to escape the tensions that had been created between he and his brother. And after some 14 years now, he's returning home. He's going to meet his brother and he's, he's scared to death. He thinks Esau is going to come with his armies and, and destroy him for all of the fighting and the tension and the hatred and the antagonism that had been built up between them for all of those years. But it says in Genesis chapter 33 and verse 4 that when Esau saw him, his brother, he ran and embraced him. He fell on his neck and kissed him. Doesn't it remind you of that story in the New Testament of the son who was unhappy with his life at home? He asked his father for his inheritance, and he took that money and went into a far country and lived for himself and, and uh, squandered all that he had until eventually he found himself helpless and destitute and, and hopeless. And he said, I'm going to go home to my father. Maybe I could be a servant in his house. And as he approached his home, he saw his father down the road. And we read in Luke chapter 15 and verse 20 that his father ran and embraced him and kissed him. A kiss was an act of reconciliation. Uh, it symbolized a decision to return. After days, months, perhaps years of hostility, anger, bitterness, estrangement, all of those things were erased in a moment by this kiss of reconciliation and a broken, hurting relationship restored and revived. This decision to return, this kiss of reconciliation is evidenced in sorrow. 
You see, there has to be genuine contrition. There has to be turning from those past wrongs, admitting the failures of the past. And the evidence of of sorrow and contrition, repenting, turning back to heal this relationship that's been broken. And often that takes grace on our part to admit our wrong. And turning from that which we ha- in which we have offended others and seeking their forgiveness. A kiss was an act of reconciliation, a decision to return evidenced in sorrow and genuine contrition. Perhaps this morning you have grown false in your worship. Perhaps you have failed in your subjugation to the deity of Christ. Maybe there's someone here this morning who has never believed in Jesus Christ as personal Savior. Perhaps this morning you're here and you know the Savior, but you've been feigned in your loyalty. You've refused always to submit to him. You've kissed him like Judas. You've kissed him with your lips, but you betrayed him. With your life. Perhaps you're here this morning and you've been fickle in your affections. You've not sacrificed yourself to the love of Christ alone. You've passed out your kisses indiscriminately. You've loved the world instead of the Lord, but you cannot love the world and the Lord at the same time. Divided love is no love at all. Have you been false in your worship? Have you been feigned in your loyalty? Have you been fickle in your affection? There is the kiss of reconciliation. Sorrow over a broken relationship, restoration of singular worship, of undivided loyalty, of selfless love. Kiss the son, the psalmist says. In Micah 6, verses 7 and 8, we read these words. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He hath shown thee, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of thee? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. See, God is not interested in your religiosity He's interested in your worship. He's interested in your loyalty. He's interested in your love. If Psalm 2 tells us anything, it tells us that God does not toy with human insolence, with insubordination, with indifference toward the sovereign Christ. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, created this world sustains this world. He will rule this world. And we must kiss the Son, lest he be angry and we perish from the way. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful psalm and this fascinating phrase that intrigues us. We are called in this psalm to kiss the Son. To kiss your Son, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the King who will come and bring again into subjugation all things created under your authority. But he is not only the coming and ruling king and sovereign, he is the suffering servant, the savior. And Father, we are amazed by your grace. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ to save us by dying for our sins. Father, give us wisdom to kiss your son as an act of worship, to recognize his authority and his power, to recognize his work on the cross, 
and to trust in him. Help us, Father, to kiss your son as an act of loyalty, submitting ourselves to his leadership and his will, not betraying him with our lives, but serving him because he's given himself for us and leads us. And Father, help us to kiss your son as an act of love. Help us to love him and him alone. Help us not to have divided affections. Father, help us commit ourselves to loving our Savior as he loved us. And Father, all of us fail in our worship. We fail in our loyalty. We fail in our love. And we're thankful that there is in Scripture the kiss of reconciliation. In sorrow, we can turn back to you. Restore our singular worship. Submit again in loyalty to our sovereign and love him as we should with all our heart and soul and might. There's someone here today without Christ. We pray that they would come to him today. And Father, if there is misguided loyalty and mislaid affection, we pray that today would be a day of restoration. Thank you for your mercy and your grace toward us. In Jesus' name.